All right. So imagine that you're a CISO and one day you wake up to news, let's say on a Monday, because all the fun things happen on a weekend, right? Uh, you wake up news to news Monday that your company was breached. And you check your emails and find that teams were busy without you at work. Um, in an email thread, legal forwarded to you the night prior, you could see everyone making decisions, arguing, taking bold actions, and the, uh, and the chief of operations decided to make a statement to the press. That statement to the press uh, apparently uh, was filled with inaccuracies. It gives way more information that should have been released. Your security team also seemed to be unaware of the matter and just received emails themselves about this matter. And now the CEO is calling you and wanting an update for the board and your audit department are fielding questions for third parties that need your attention. Welcome to a Monday. But everything went to plan, or rather, things didn't go to plan because you didn't have a plan. And uh, things never go to plan when you don't have a plan. So that's, uh, that's kind of the name, the, the name of this talk and how we, how we came here. But they didn't have a plan, so we're going to make one now. So um, basically, uh, I'm Ajab, and uh, my laptop really wants you to know that it is disconnected from Wi-Fi. Um, but I'm odd job. I've been hacking for 12 years. Uh, I'm a noob. Uh, my, uh, my first DEF CON was uh, 20. Uh, every time I hear someone say, like, oh, yeah, DEF CON 6, it's like, noob. Someone's always in the room was at an earlier DEF CON than you. Um, I, you might remember me from such talks at B-Sides Las Vegas as uh, busting biases in InfoSec. So that was a, that was a fun talk, I think, uh, from a couple of years ago. It's uh, also streamed and also recorded. Um, I also like to brew mead. Um, so if you have questions about that, happy to share that hobby. I also host the, uh, uh, a YouTube channel called A Glass of Zero J. I basically just talk about interesting things. I have probably stayed away from the crowd strike stuff because we're still finding all sorts of fun nuggets of information and things that we got wrong. And I like to have information correct before I just go ahead and uh, say a bunch of stuff about it. But uh, need to get on that soon. Uh, and I'm also the senior director uh, of Detect and Response for a health company, um, but I'm not here in that capacity. So even if you know what that company is, uh, I'm here in my own personal capacity. Uh, but that is kind of more of a level of my experience and uh, where I've been in uh, different companies uh, throughout my career so far. Um, so, you know, when we would need to think about this as, uh, by the way, enjoy the lovely AI art. A um, lot of interesting things, totally not related to this talk, but totally interesting things while I was creating like little bits of AI, like, oh yeah, CISO, wondering, uh, you know, how, where to start on building a cyber incident response plan. That, that hand is cursed. That elbow is cursed. Um, but uh, every time you ask for just a person, uh, it always gives you a white man. Uh, so then I ask for someone androgynous, and they still always give you someone white. Uh, when you ask for a non-white person, they always give you a black person, so never have anyone of any other um, uh, potential ethnicity. A uh, lot of interesting things with AI image generation. Uh, but these are the cursed AI's uh, images that I came up with. Uh, that one also, uh, how many fingers are merged into his skull there. Um, which is actually an accurate the depiction of what that CISO was probably doing at that time, merging the fingers into his brain. Um, uh, so basically, uh, you know, where to start with a cyber incident response plan, right? Uh, you actually may find out that uh, you already have one. Uh, your predecessor, uh, even if you're not a CISO, you may just be an incident response uh, lead or director, uh, you may already have one uh, that you didn't write, someone else did, and maybe they didn't do the best job at it. Or maybe what they did is it's 80 pages long and is, you know, they took NIST, they took CISA, they took 12 other standards or other things they could possibly do and just crunched them all into one thing. They said, that looks good, that looks good, let's put it all into one document. That is not the way to write a SERP at all. And you may think, oh, it just needs to pass compliance. I, if your compliance people are worth their salt, they're gonna say, yeah, this is not good. This, there's no way anybody can follow this and know how to work with this. Um, but that's, that's what I find with a lot of people's cyber incident response plans. Way too long, way too many details, not the right details, um, usually too many details about the wrong things you need to actually be worried about. 
Um, but hey, it's a place to start. Uh, that may already have approvals by your compliance department or quality, depending on what all you need to uh, get approvals for. Um, so that may be a place to start. You may decide that I can chuck all of this away. You may actually look at some of the roles and responsibilities and figure out, oh, there's some people here that may need to be involved in incidents I wasn't even aware of. So kind of do some reconnaissance uh, if you do have a cyber incident response plan that's poorly written or maybe suboptimally and start there and see what you can salvage. But what we need to do when we start with a cyber incident response um, plan is we need to start with people. So I like the framework people process technology. Does everybody know, has everybody heard people process technology? All right, okay, so it's a way of thinking. Um, really, I was kind of thinking about this earlier today even, like just people process technology, that's the way in which you should really set up your organizations. You should look for good people, you should put, give them good processes to follow, and tools that you give them should be able to align to those processes. I see so many people start information security programs with, we're gonna get tools. Hey, and then we're gonna, we're gonna figure out how to use those tools and then we need to hire people who know how to use those tools. So then you get job descriptions that say, I need someone with like 15 years of this particular tool, not just firewalls in general, Fortinet specifically. Uh, even though Fortinet may not have 20 years of <laughs> existence out there, or maybe their N NSC licenses haven't been out there forever, um, you still have to have that. And so that's where you get these job descriptions that are just overloaded and overburdened with tool specific things that you don't need. Um, but that's where you start with tech and go backwards. Uh, think about it, you know, tech really dry, allows your processes to work. Your processes allow your people to work. So you can really start from anything and understand how each part processes the other. But really we need to think about the who. We need to think about our people. Um, and not just our people, people outside of our organization as well, because we have to report to people as well, outside of our organization in, a, in an incident, especially nowadays with the SEC uh, knocking on people's doors wanting to know uh, about that breach that you should have reported on your, uh, what is it, 8K or 10K? Um, so uh, one of the first things I like to, to go and do is get your key contacts. Um, so getting to understand your folks like your technology SMEs. Now I put technology SMEs there first because I think it's the most relatable to us. They're probably not the first people you even need to go talk to. You may actually want to talk to some other things and, and figure out some other people like your lines of business in product and manufacturing and sales. Uh, you may not have OT or SCADA in your environment, um, but I'm just putting it in there just to kind of help you understand where these folks are. Um, customer success and service can be very important to understand where they are. Um, your business support in HR, right? So if we're doing an incident that involves an insider threat, do you have authorization to go prying into their personal lives and go prying into the data that may or may not be their browsing history and start uncovering things that they may need to be doing? After all, an insider could be taking information from the company and putting it into their own Google Drive or ProtonMail or something else. Um, do you have authorization? Do you know you have authorization? to go ahead and start seeing what are they putting into these personal things. Um, maybe they are even using platforms such as uh, health platforms to uh, um, have notes because usually health platforms, for instance, have an air of privacy around them. You actually don't want to uh, start decrypting um, you know, network traffic out to health platforms because that's someone's PHI. And now you might have to be responsible for that. Um, so you have to probably involve HR to understand at least what your kind of, your standing orders, what can you do? What are clear, clear engagement points you can do or criteria to do that? And where do you need to say, hmm, before we go further, let's make sure HR is clued in. And you know what, let's throw legal in there too, because we're probably dealing with laws, especially if you're a global company. Uh, how you handle a German citizen is gonna be very different than the way you handle American citizens. How you handle a Chinese citizen is gonna be very different than how you handle uh, an Indian citizen. They all have very different privacy expectations and especially where that data is allowed to go. You may have to keep all of your evidence or data if it's about people in a particular location. So those are important things to kind of keep in mind. 
Again, these are great people to have. You don't know even what technology, what process to put into until you start talking to these people. That's why people are so important. Let's talk finance, right? So in the middle of an incident, you think at some point you're going to need to do probably one of two things. You're going to need to either tell your insurance about something. Your finance department usually handles insurance. So you're probably going to need to partner, first of all, probably go talk to them before an incident and <laughs> ask them about insurance. But you also maybe have an incident response retainer, right? And so how do you pay for that? Most incident response retainers are pretty good in that, you know, they don't want money up front. Uh, they, they, they figure that out, out after the fact. But you're going to still need to make sure finance is in the loop so that they understand what really is going on here, what's the contract here, what's the velocity of the cost. You know, are we talking, you know, we have to do 40 hours at minimum at $300 an hour. What are we talking here? And how much is this going to cost? And do we want to actually engage in that cost, right? Um, they're going to help make that decision. Facilities. Facilities and physical security can be very interesting. What happens if you're in a situation uh, where you have, for whatever reason, abandoned an office, uh, evacuated it, but you still need to go in, someone needs to go in and be able to pull out hard drives uh, and do forensic examination on those? How do you get in and access to these places to get your hands on things or get somebody's hands on them, right? So those are people you'll probably want. Regulatory and quality, pretty obvious there. Uh, you've got laws to comply with. You have laws and organizations that are going to be coming after you wanting to know about things. You need to know what clocks exist and when those clocks start ticking. Again, legal reads these contracts and laws as well. They're going to help you with these definitions. Sometimes legal, well, hopefully most of the time, legal's the one making the decision when a clock starts for your company. Um, but keep in mind uh, and talk to your le legal team about what does the contract language say? For instance, does it say uh, within 24 hours of a suspected compromise of data, you are to notify me as the customer? What's a suspected compromise? Every similar, in my experience, is a suspected compromise. <laughs> it's being brought up for a reason. We have an alert in that for some reason. It could be false positive, but right now it is a suspected event. It is a sp suspected incident at any time. So, you know, they may, uh, you know, they may not be so happy to be uh, getting subscription uh, or uh, notifications from your SIM every day. Hey, we, we got an incident. We got, a, we, got a, we got an event. We got an event. Well, that's probably not what they mean. They probably mean something else. Confirmed compromise or confirmed incident is language that I know I prefer and some other folks I've worked with prefer because that now is this is the time we can document it. This is the time we actually have confirmed there is impact. That is impact that is defined as to the parameters of these contracts, these laws, these regulations. So pay very close attention to that. Of course, your legal team should be. But this is always a good talking point because someone may look at that and not know that you know some of these things. And they may go like, yeah, sure, suspected compromise. What does that mean? You may have to help educate them and help them understand that. And of course, your technology MS, uh, SMEs. I kind of went in reverse order there. Um, you are not the expert in everything, right? You may have come from database. You may have come from application. You may have come from uh, identity access management or even privacy. But you do not know all of those things. Uh, even if you're a database person, you may have just been a Postgres database person. Have you ever touched Oracle? <laughs> there are interesting nuances there. Hey, who all, what all uh, queries did uh, you know, user A make on this Oracle database from this time to this time? May take you a while. Sure, you can Google. May take you a while. Or you need to know who your technology SMEs are to be able to contact in the middle of an incident, right? And get, get people, especially in technology, but in some of these other areas too, get a primary and a secondary. Because guess what? Some people are on PTO. And in some countries, depending on if your SME is in, uh, like I said, Germany or uh, Europe, uh, PTO is sacred. You don't come off PTO. Uh, you, you, you're on vacation and you don't have to answer your phone or anything. So who else is going to take that call, hopefully, right? And then hopefully they're not on vacation at the same time. Uh, but have a process for escalation to get somebody else who can direct you to another SME, right? Um, and really, all of these people, 
don't need to be involved in the same types of incidents, right? And so what we really do have is we have, you could possibly break cert, SOC and cert out to two groups. I know people who do that. But really, two groups exist here. You've got the people who are more boots on the ground handling the incident day to day. So this is your security operations center. These are also your extended teams, more in a not executive leadership capacity, but in a leadership capacity in their various lines or departments. Um, and so they're going to make decisions like, what does a communication to our customers need to look like? What language should we avoid? Hey, we're going to make a statement to the press. First of all, why? <laughs> but we're going to make a statement to the press. Is everybody good with what's being said here? Um, and so, you know, if you're a CISO or you have a CISO, they're going to want to definitely be on, on that. Uh, you know, customer success is probably going to want to be on it. If you have corporate comms or external comms, you may even be engaging an external party, uh, such as uh, crisis communications and things like that. They may come in and say, we recommend you make a statement like this. Stay away from this language. Um, so you'll, you'll definitely want the, those types of things. But generally, that's what I mean when I say SOC, insert. And the SOC, of course, in, involves your, uh, your, your, your usual suspects, your tier one through three, your incident response folks, uh, your security management, and also IT management and uh, the SMEs there as well. Um, again, kind of those usual suspects. Um, technical tasks, you're trying to eradicate the threat and restore, uh, restore the, the functions of the business. Um, executive committee, okay, this is the oh crap moment, this company could be gone tomorrow. Uh, or maybe it's not that bad, but it still is something that requires, uh, you know, uh, the CEO or that person's direct uh, um, reports attention. And so, uh, you know, so we, we talk about making decisions at a more strategic level about how to handle things. Um, a lot of times, uh, hopefully, uh, whether or not to pay a ransom, for instance, um, <laughs> is probably well above your pay grade, uh, hopefully is, uh, and is more so at a board level or at an executive leadership team level. So uh, definitely those people need to be involved at that point. Uh, but it's very important to kind of keep these roles separate. There's usually for every line of business, there's somebody up at that level who has ultimate ownership of that area. So it's chief legal counsel. You may have legal who you deal with day to day in your SOC cert, but you also have the chief legal counsel. Um, so that person can be different or maybe they're the same, right? So it depends on your, your company and uh, what they're doing. I wanna make sure I have all of my notes here. Oh, good, fantastic. So there's a, there, there's a little bit of an example, and by the way, there'll be a QR code at the end to scan uh, that will take you, first of all, to uh, our lovely friend Rick Roll, but also uh, will take you to my GitLab, where you can see the uh, slides, as well as an example SERP to get you started. Um, uh, don't just copy paste. Uh, there are places to replace your company name, but also other places to uh, uh, fill in more information. But you're going to see like this, roles and responsibilities. You're going to see titles. You're going to see names. Some of the titles are more functions within an incident, like incident leader. That's not a, maybe it's a, maybe incident response leader is a uh, title at your company. But it, in this case, it's more of the who's actually running this incident. It could be different people, but it is a role nonetheless for a given incident that needs to be fulfilled. Um, legal ethics and compliance, right? That, that probably is going to be assigned to a particular person in that situation. But anyway, this is in the document. I just want to show you what that, what that generally looks like. You'll have responsibilities and, of course, how to get a hold of those people. Um, we come to the process part, right? So people, we now have our people understood. Now we need to start laying out process. And kind of when you start figuring out process, you start doing boring things like talking about scope and definitions. Uh, so let's talk about definitions. Um, one of the first definitions you're probably going to want to craft is what is a security event? What is a security incident? What's a breach? What's a compromise? Those are very important things, especially the B word. Breach is a very important word. Uh, there's a lot of contractual things that talk about breach. There's a lot of regulatory and legal things that talk about breach. Consult very carefully with your data privacy, regulatory, and legal folks. They are going to probably tell you what breach means. You probably get some input on it, but your opinion does not matter as much as theirs in this arena. But very important, though, is what is the difference between a security event 
and a security incident. To me, incident is where we start looking at confirmation. We have a confirmed event here. A security event could be anything. A security event could be a third party just told us that there's compromised credentials on the dark web. Okay, can we verify that? Um, it could be, uh, you know, somebody you found uh, an event where Microsoft told you someone clicked on a phishing link. Well, was that link actually phishing? I've seen false positives, right? So how do you go and, and take care of that? So everything coming into your SIM, every time someone clicks on that fish alert button, every time someone says, hey, something funky just happened on my laptop, I think it may be compromised, those are security events. We then go through a process that we'll talk about in a little bit to determine is it actually an incident or is this, and how bad is it? So incident severity. This is where we already start kind of telling uh, the boundaries of what an incident is. Um, this is very high level. There's more details about incident severity in the example SERP. It is suggestions. Uh, you can put more definition in there. You can even add a fourth severity, and I've seen some people put a fifth severity level in there. Three is probably a good minimum. You have a high, medium, or low, right? Um, I like to have a fourth. One is critical, two is high. And the real difference between SEV2 and SEV1 to me in, in, in SERPs I like to do is am I getting the CEO out of bed on a 2 a.m. A 2 a.m. on a weekend? That's a SEV1. <laughs> if I'm not, it's probably a SEV2. We might reevaluate and see if it's a SEV1 later, right? So that's generally my little gut check. It's not written in the, in the SERP that way. <laughs> hey, if I'm waking up the CEO at 2 a.m. On a, on a Saturday, it doesn't get written that way, but that's the idea. That's the feeling behind it. Um, but here is just generally, right? We have low impact, right? And impact can be anything. Impact could be financial, right? Maybe you had a business email compromise and someone walked away with $3,000. If you're a multi-billion dollar company, $3,000 I, you lose track of that, you know, every, every hour. You lose track of $3,000 every hour, every transaction. You don't care, probably. It may be a low severity impact based purely on the financial aspect. But if it's maybe a $5 million loss because of some transaction that was going down, someone got in the middle of, then that may go towards a high impact, right? So there's materiality to look at too. Uh, as far as impact, and <laughs> we are finding out with some of these lawsuits that are going on, um, we don't really know what the definition of materiality is with the SEC. Uh, so the jury uh, literally is still out on that, um, and uh, we're still figuring that out. But uh, definitely talk to your lawyers on what they think materiality means for your company, uh, because again, they get the say on that. You're, you have input, but their opinion matters. Yours doesn't on that matter. So go with what they say. Um, you'll also be more protected in that way, too. It's like you're at the advice of counsel. I defined it this way. Um, we'll talk about privilege in a bit, too. Also, kind of think about severities. Who's getting involved? At a severity three, there's no reason to get the CEO even involved. There's probably not even a reason to call your chief technology officer up or, you know, someone else, your CFO. There's no reason probably to bother them, most likely, except for maybe after the fact maybe on a quarterly basis you say, here's the incidents we had in a summary of those. Um, so severity three, I add that fourth level on there for kind of your everyday things. I like adding a fourth one to say, hey, malware got installed on this person's machine. It didn't do anything. We caught it in time. It was prevented. We have cleaned the machine or maybe we've even got a laptop uh, swap out going on. We're good. Confirmed that yes, an event happened, but nothing of impact happened to us and we prevented further, you know, thing, bad things from happening. I don't need legal involved in that unless there's some, I don't know, maybe boundary that was crossed as far as what device it was, what data was potentially on there. I don't really have to go further into that, right? Um, so you may want to add that fourth one in there. Otherwise, severity three is pretty, severity three, two, and one give you pretty good ideas on how to delineate. Um, you also have incident categories, right? And these incident categories, do a lot of things. They give you tags, for instance, to start figuring out, hey, how many uh, malware events did I have this year? How many uh, insider threat events did we happen? Oh, by the way, insider threat, um, 
You may be thinking disgruntled employee who's going to sell data to another place, maybe some corporate espionage, maybe you hired North Korea and didn't realize it. Um, no before, <laughs> if that's not a publicity stunt. <laughs> um, and so, uh, you know, you have DDoS, uh, but insider threat also is people who click phish links. Uh, people who accidentally download the wrong FileZilla, if there's a right FileZilla even. Um, but, uh, <laughs> uh, but people who download those types of things, um, that is an insider threat. User error, user mistakes, uh, that is what's considered insider threat. It does not necessarily call malicious intent, right? Okay. Um, you know, compromised credentials, phishing, a lot of these things can be the same incident. You know, you could have a malware incident that involves compromised credentials as well. You could have a zero day exploit that uh, also involves business email compromise. It allows you to understand the complexity and the multi multifaceted nature of a particular incident. I've even seen people use categories along with the MITRE ATT&CK uh, framework to kind of figure out at what point or kind of where did the attacker get to. If your incident is purely more on a, a reconnaissance level or maybe initial access level and nothing further, that may be good data to key on later, right, in an incident. Okay, we had a lot of initial access events and we're stopping those from getting further. Uh, oh, we had someone get lateral movement. How do we make sure that we don't get lateral movement to these people in the future? You don't do that unless you categorize your incidents. So being, being able to not only determine if it's an incident, assign its severity and get the right people involved and make sure you have categories so that after the fact and even during the fact you understand what is the nature of this uh, incident very quickly helps a lot. Um, we also have an, as part of our process we have incident phases, right? Um, Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay, cool. So yeah, so we have incident phases. First of all is identifying, right? We have identifying incidents. Uh, this is anything. This could be third parties talking to you, you know, your sim alerts. Uh, we have triage and escalation. This is where you really start saying what is the severity of this incident? And then depending on that severity, who do I need to call to start actually an incident bridge, right? So does an incident bridge even need to be started? and who needs to be on it. Um, that, that's where your SOC is going to start realizing very quickly how, how big this is and get the right people involved. Um, and, you know, again, this is also where, you know, legal might say, okay, we need to start preserving evidence. We're going to start uh, privilege. Um, that's very important to make sure legal can establish privilege. You don't get to establish privilege. You're not a lawyer. Uh, this is attorney-client privilege, right? Things that are said to your attorney as far as the matter is concerned and the advice that they give you is not something that's generally subpoenable without certain exceptions, I'm sure, especially if it's of a criminal nature. Uh, the, generally, the, well, <laughs> to cover up a crime, uh, for instance, uh, would possibly not uh, go for... Um, uh, go for privilege, but I'm not a lawyer. Um, but, uh, you know, privilege is very important. You can't just invoke privilege, usually, you can't just invoke privilege by copying your lawyer in there. That's just not how that works. They, they're the ones to invoke privilege and give instruction that this is to remain only with these parties. If you talk to someone else, do not give them information unless by a need to know basis only again, at the direction of counsel. Uh, contain and um, containment and eradication. So now we're trying to stop the bad people. We're trying to kick them out of our environment as well, right? So this is also where you've probably called in your incident response retainers, depending on how bad this is. Uh, you've maybe isolated people's machines, reset their credentials, kick people out of their accounts for a time being. Um, and that's where that starts happening. Uh, you have your restoration of recovery, pretty much what it sounds like. We're getting the business back up and going. We're getting users access. Sometimes it may have to be crappy access. Maybe they had a nice laptop with everything they needed. Now they're going to have to deal with a VDI for a while uh, until you can get them a laptop. So they may have degraded, um, uh, degraded experience, but experience nonetheless. And recovery. So you may also notice that you aren't really responsible usually for recovering data. Right? You are not the BCP, nor are you the DR uh, specialist. But those people are also a part of your incident response. Um, 
probably the most important step in this entire process, I would say, is your postmortem and uh, your, your post-incident activities. These are, this is where you learn every step of the way, where did we go wrong? What could have been better? What things did go well? What saved our bacon here from this being an even worse situation? Very important to call out, especially to executive leadership. Uh, you know, imagine your board and saying, yeah, we had these severity two or severity one incidents. Here's the thing though, because you invested in these things, you got our people involved uh, and paid for, you got you know, the right resources. We're now, we were able to uh, keep this from becoming an even worse, uh, a worse matter. So your investment is working, but maybe a change in strategy, maybe moving this, pri this strategic item up in priority uh, may help us in the future to avoid this situation. Also, do you need to uh, improve your SERP? Uh, hey, we didn't understand really if this was a SEV2 or a SEV3. So we didn't know what to do. So we just called a SEV3, what we should have called a SEV2. What do you do in those situations? Well, you might wanna go back in the SERP and you might wanna add some clarifications or some, hey, you can also kind of uh, escalate it a little beyond what it probably is to get, to get initial action urgently going and then you can back off later, right? So those are different types of things you might have in your uh, postmortems. Um, Along with each phase of these, right, you're gonna have very specific tasks. And again, this is in the SERP that's in the example at the end with the QR code. Um, you basically have what phase we're in, you're gonna have the type of activity that is gonna be carried out, and then who is going to carry that out. So this is a very important thing where an executive, for instance, should be able to look at your SERP, should be able to see, okay, where am I in this? Oh, okay, who, where are my peers involved in this? Legal, other people. Who makes the decision about this? Okay, I can see that. And then where do I make decisions? Oh, there's me, there's me, there's me. And now I understand what I'm here to do. Where are we? Oh, we're here, down in the escalation phase. Okay, we've, we've just begun basically. Fantastic, now we understand where we are. You know, it's a big old map that says you are here. Um, you should be able to do that with only like 10 minutes of reading a SERP, understand those things. And if it's 60 to 80 pages long, that, that, that's not gonna happen. So you gotta make sure we keep this brief. Lastly, we have the technology part of our incident response. So there's all kinds of areas here, right? Um, we've got things like, how are we gonna even track this incident? So we've got a nice, we've got a nice SERP, it's a great process, but how are we gonna document and how are we gonna keep these things together? Yes, even saying I'm going to type this up in a OneNote notebook or I'm going to type this up and put it into Snow or Jira or a super secret SharePoint that only some people have access to. It's very important to say here's where information about this goes. Here's where we're tracking this. Here's where we're tracking post-incident activities. Very important to keep that documented and understood. Um, and again, understanding, you know, you may even need external incident response platforms. Because what happens when all of a sudden uh, <clears throat> a particular kernel uh, level uh, software ends up taking out your entire business? Um, what happens when something like that or a airplane crashes into your data center? You know, what happens when something happens that you know, really disables your ability to do business, even the business of security? You may even need a third party system to track and work that incident, even bringing in those communications. Which kind of brings me to out of band communications. Um, let's say you can't trust talking to your CEO on Teams or your chief legal on Teams or even your CISO or your team members on Teams. Maybe you see that somebody now has O365 admin. They can read everything. They can get into everything and see it. So now you need to go someplace they don't have access to that is already prearranged and understood. And the, and the best time, the worst time to decide to use out-of-band communications and what you're gonna do is during an incident. Okay, how are we gonna, how are we gonna do this? Um, quick and dirty, many times people will go signal. Signal's a great way to do that. Well, yes and no. First of all, you already need to know that we're gonna use signal and here's how we're gonna do. Maybe we have a, maybe you even have a, a super secret treehouse club, uh, you know, a password and a challenge response phrase uh, that you're gonna use, but you have to have something already prearranged so that people understand what you're trying to do, even within your own SOC team. Um, but you might need to do that just initially to uh, get some things going. Um, the problem with Signal 
is it is en the beauty of Signal is it's end to end encrypted. Signal doesn't have a copy of any of these things. The bad thing about Signal is it's end to end encrypted, and your device now becomes subpoenaable if a lawsuit is involved. Potentially, again, I'm not a lawyer. Talk to your lawyer about this strategy. Um, in a pinch, it could probably work for some things to at least maybe get some things going, but I wouldn't want to discuss too much on Signal. Um, I'd want to go to maybe a Google workspace, right? If I'm a Microsoft shop or if I'm a Google shop, maybe a Microsoft space, completely separated from SSO. And I can whip up these accounts really quick and get people involved, maybe through their signal. Um, I can get them into their environments. We can do we can do our own call bridging over there. There are also platforms that literally just are geared towards being an incident response platform where you can bring people in securely and you can also then have communications uh, that, are, that are encrypted, secure, uh, and the subpoena goes to that, right? You don't have it on your phone where you may have content and other things you don't want <laughs> courts uh, uh, potentially getting access to, uh, even if it's just to mark it as not responsive. Um, so forensics, uh, who in here uh, has a forensics arm of their company? Oh, one. Cool. Awesome. It's not something. Now, you all probably do a little bit of forensics, you know, figuring out what uh, artifacts are going on or how did this attack happen on this machine. But you're probably not whipping out NCASE every day. You're probably not doing a lot of other, you know, memory, memory analysis, whipping out volatility every other day to do this. You're going to need to bring in the experts. It is such a ridiculously specialized field out there. Not only that, but how many people in this room can give expert testimony in court and are certified to do that. Yeah, no, that's your incident response retainer. They have people like that on staff who, who literally are, are, are built to do that and can say, yes, I know that image of the hard drive is the, is the same copy unmodified because of this. And yes, they're going to use checksums and other things, but they're going to be able to give that witness test, witness, witness testimony, hopefully not with hard drives, witness testimony to it. Uh, you can't do that. Um, All right, I'm gonna make sure. On my on my little laptop, it kind of kind of goes crooked, so I have to kind of go like this one. Um, all right, cool. So wrap it up already. We've been talking a long time about incident response plan, um, all the things you need to go in. I think there's uh, there's a basic process to writing this here, and I think you can get this in five pretty easy steps. Figure out your roles and responsibilities, who your key contacts are. Um, also, have a little conversation with them. You're not going to do the road show yet. Have a conversation, especially with those more key contacts like legal, HR, finance, and even get their insight into, hey, let's say tabletop a couple things with them real quick. Say we had this. Say we had a business email compromise and this happened. When do you want to be notified about that? When do you think you need to get involved? They may be wrong, uh, but they're more than likely going to be right uh, in what, what they think. Um, so have those little conversations to help understand where, where in the process you need to accommodate them. Get your definitions right. Make sure everybody's on the same page with it, right? And understanding when are we actually in a breach or not. Uh, too many times someone will just use the word breach very haphazardly with a customer or a regulator. Those ears perk up, especially if they're compliance or audit people, and go, well, you didn't notify us. Well, you used the wrong word. You did, that wasn't a breach. <laughs> that was just a malware event that uh, was quickly remediated. Um, get, uh, get the incident process laid out. You may, you may use NIST. Maybe you're a NIST organization and you have to use NIST. Completely fine to do so. There may be other frameworks you want to use. This is a suggestion. It is malleable. I did take NIST and just tweak it to my own little uh, heart's content uh, because there are a couple little items. So I'm like, ah, you can merge those two <laughs> um, to make it a little easier. Road show this. During an incident is not the first time these people should know what the incident response plan is. You need to roadshow it and say, you're part of this plan. And oh, by the way, you're also the person who's doing business continuity planning. You are doing business continuity planning, right? Uh, you know, you need to have your own process because guess what? This SERP is not your business continuity plan. It may trigger and engage those plans, but this isn't your, your BCP. And then test it. 
right? Let's do unit testing on this. <laughs> uh, let's, uh, in user acceptance testing, let's do a tabletop. Let's get the execs down. Let's get the, the technical folks down. Get your technical folks on a separate tabletop. Have them run through it. This is interesting and do it before the executive tabletop. Why? Because now you're going to find all the tools and capabilities you think you theoretically have at your disposal. Oh, but actually, yeah, you, you have no idea how to use them or, or do that. Oh, hi, this database goes out. What do we do? Well, restore from backup. Yeah, we haven't backed that up in three years. <laughs> okay, cool. Write it down. Execs, hey, we do that. We'll restore from backup. Yeah, unfortunately, that hasn't been backed up in three years. There may be some surprises but it's a very important to tabletop these things so that people start understanding and realizing what are the capabilities we have, what are we missing, what are our gaps, and how do we need to prepare more for an incident. Kind of a, a phase of cyber incident response planning I left off was that preparation phase. It's a big cycle, right? We're always preparing. Um, yeah, and do this annually. Do it every year. Bring it, you can bring it internally, but you can also bring in external. A lot of times your uh, incident response retainers have hours left over or have money left over at the end of the year. Some people use that for their pen test. Sometime, just go ahead and say, let's do a tabletop this year instead. Let, let's pay for a pen test separately, but let's use, this for a, let, let's use this for a tabletop this year. Let's get someone else on our pen test. <laughs> let's, have, let's have someone else have a crack at us. Um, the very important thing I've been when writing is don't get in the weeds on tech. Uh, this is much more about business process. Um, so if you if you have screen captures of security tools or network tools or firewall rules and a whole bunch of other things, uh, you're doing it wrong. Uh, there may be some appendices that that might go into. Those are probably more. Um, uh, uh, standard operating procedures or standard work instructions that you want as playbooks that might uh, that might follow on to a SERP, right? Um, also, like I said before, executives should be able to read this in 10 minutes. And also you should be able to, to read it fairly quickly and kind of skim it and understand what's going on. Um, again, stay high level. You're going to be able to keep 20 to 25 pages maximum. And that's including the title page and the table of context and the scope and object uh, uh, objective of this paper. Um, and, and again, it's not inclusive of every single other process, but you may want to have an appendix item that calls out other business processes that this may call out as well. Uh, most importantly, start talking and writing. Right, So uh, I, I will have given you a very good start on it, uh, but start talking to other people. And in six months, you actually can have a SERP drafted, revised, and approved, and ready for testing and road showing. Uh, so hopefully this helps you. Hopefully it's given you some good thoughts. This isn't one of those talks where it's like super technical. I'm showing you how to do something major and amazing. Uh, this is a journey I've gone through in the past couple roles I've been in. And so kind of just sharing some of my lessons learned and uh, trying to keep it simpler and, and easier to start. And don't let perfect get in the way of good. Regardless, there's always a better way to write a SERP and you'll find those. Make that version two, make that version three. You got to start with version one though. Well, technically zero, but you'll you got to start with version one, right? Um, and that's where we, where we find ourselves here at the end of, uh, the end of this presentation. Uh, that QR code does lead to my GitLab. You will see both a B-Sides Fort Wayne as well as B-Sides Las Vegas folder. Uh, the LV folder shows this exact slide deck. You'll know because I have a colorful uh, Camon here uh, versus uh, more of a, a black and white one for the other one. Uh, and it also had a couple uh, of those example uh, screen caps in there as well. Um, and then it'll also have the... Um, um, I think a Word document or a PDF of the actual, or no, a Word document of the actual uh, uh, example SERP. Um, so, and it's got, I think, company in bold words, so you can find a replace and put your own company name in it. And you're probably a good way uh, on the way to writing your SERP already. But do give it a thorough read over, change things, change language, have at it, but it'll give you a good framework to start. Um, I, had to, I had to really look and scrape, scrimp and scrape together to find, uh, to, to get a good template going for myself. So hopefully that's a shortcut for you. Uh, any questions? Oh, we got a mic. Yeah. Gentleman, second row. There you go. First of all, thank you for a wonderful talk. And two things. What you have on is that for um, image recognition countering? 
Actually, very good. This probably is a fairly decent image recognition uh, um, uh, a thing that could probably fool some things. Uh, but no, it is not. It's just some face jewelry. Uh, this is since we're spooky themed, uh, Halloween themed here uh, at uh, at B sides Las Vegas. I was like, oh, let's be a Raven Lord and let's uh, just have some fun and let's explore uh, some occult and uh, other types of uh, themes here. Okay. Second, uh, you mentioned Signal. Yes. Um, I assume that you're familiar with disappearing messages on Signal? Yes. I don't know how effective they would be uh, with regards to subpoena, so can you address that? Spoliation of evidence is another thing that uh, you know, you're going to want to talk to your lawyer about, because if you destroy communications that could be part of a legal investigation at some point, that could be considered spoliation of evidence. Some lawyers have told me before that if you spoil evidence, the jury or judge can use that to say, uh, there's a, there's an adverse judgment or prejudice now against you with regards to what they're. So if the other side is saying these things are what those said, it's probably, they're going to assume that's probably more in their ballpark rather than yours. So again, talk to your lawyer about using disappearing messages in a signal chat uh, if you're doing incident response out of band. So that's Thank a you. good point. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, you talk about tabletop exercises. Yes. Um, so I'm f f f familiar with uh, CISA has a bunch, but yes. do you know of any other resources? Um, so I can be kind of be like a tabletop dungeon master. Yeah, yeah. So uh, you also have the card game Backdoors and Breaches from Black Hills Security. Actually doesn't do too bad of a job. And you can play it online. You don't need to buy a deck. You can go online and play that. Not a plug for Black Hills. I just really like it. And you can just almost like tarot cards. You can deal yourself out uh, a, a scenario and then you go, hmm, how would we handle a scenario like that? How do we envision that would happen here? Um, you can also go to Bad Things Daily uh, on uh, formerly the artist formerly known as Twitter. Um, Bad Things Daily has a whole bunch of injects or so this just happened and it's literally just to get you thinking uh, tabletop scenarios. Um, but the CISA packages are actually really good and they cover various sectors. I was looking at three of them just this past week uh, and supply chain and they, they do a lot of different things. So uh, again, another great way to take that and just modify it how you need it to, to help your folks. A um, couple of slides back, there's a one to five list of things to do. Uh, how bad, and testing's at the end, how bad an idea do you reckon it would be to do what the software engineers do and write the tests first um, and use that as like a understanding how far or how well the rest of it's going? So you said write the test first? Yeah, so like a test driven development approach has some, you know, nice benefits. Would that sort of thing work here or maybe? So, so if I understand correctly, maybe you write a tabletop or see a tabletop first, and then you write the SERP kind of as you go through that tabletop? Is that yeah, what that could, could be? be one way to do it. Yeah, I think there's value in doing that. Again, it, there's even a possibility of you've drafted a SERP, take the SERP that I have here and just go through one of those maybe CISA, CISA documents or another tabletop you've seen before and say, okay, can I answer these questions via the SERP? Do I know what to do in this case via the SERP? That's actually a fantastic way to just kind of do those little comparisons and see uh, where some improvements need to be made without getting everybody together. Um, e again, even going to bad things daily and looking through and saying like, hmm, would it cover that? Would it cover that? Would it cover that? Those are very good points uh, there. So yeah, definitely iterative testing is probably uh, open here. Uh, hi, um, so how would you adjust this for like, uh, we're a managed stock? And we have many customers, they have different legal stuff. Yeah. 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 So, uh, so do I have to make one for each one of them or? Uh, <laughs> Fun. Yeah. So it depends on the customer, I'm sure. Oh, yeah. uh, and I've not worked in a managed service SOC. So uh, very much not uh, experienced in that. Um, but I would definitely say you probably want one that you have generally available. Mm -hmm. You want to probably work with each customer and say, here is our general cyber incident response plan. Mm -hmm. uh, do you have one you prefer we use? You may have to make some account decisions as to how much you really want to get into the cyber incident response plan and understand the specifics of it. Mm -hmm. But there's probably nuggets in there about 
what is a breach for us? What is a compromise? You probably per account want to understand and know those already. Mm -hmm. So you're probably already starting to customize your cyber incident response. But it really just depends. Is it cyber incident response from the fact that the MSP is getting breached or uh, have an incident? Or is it cyber incident response from your, your customer who is using your service just got breached and now you're needing to respond to their incident with them and so those may be two very different cyber incident response plans right so yeah so just to start gonna be a nice template yeah a general template and then we'll just fill it in i think that could be a good start yeah all right thank you yeah all right uh one more question okay Um, I have a question about people because process technology is easy. Like we define our process, you know, we can buy technology, but people is the most difficult part. So my question is from your experience, how do you get people excited about instant response? Um, legal, engineers, PR, C stuff, how you get them involved and how make them excited about the instant yeah. response? If, if people want to be excited about their company existing the next day, they'll get excited about incident response. It doesn't need to be all scare the children though, right? Um, I think, uh, you know, the people aspect, again, um, they see enough news. They already know how important this is. I, don't, I haven't really seen too many companies out there in my personal experience that you put, hey, we need to practice cyber incident response, they, that they're not going to say, oh, yeah, we, we don't need to do that. Um, I don't think there's going to be too many people who need to do that. If so, uh, maybe arrange a purple team uh, in, uh, engagement where you stage a breach and then start getting them involved. You see the chaos ensue and go, oh, by the way, this was a drill as part of our, our purple team engagement, right? And then they might get the uh, hit, kind of like pen testing, right, was at one point, just to scare the board into understanding, oh, yeah, take security seriously. Um, you know, again, the people side of it, uh, get them excited about incident response. It does take a particular person to engage in incident response. Actually, I don't want people to be excited during an incident. I want them cool as cucumbers. Sometimes you have a nothing burger, an executive is at an eight, and you're like, I need you at a four, but the temperature's really at a two. <laughs> but I need you back down at a four at least, because that's where I can handle you. You need, as an incident leader, to be the coolest person in the room right now. We're working the problem. We're not working people. We're not working blame gaming or anything like that. So actually, you want people to not be excited uh, during an incident. Cool minds and heads and all that. Okay. All right. Thank you, Ajahn. Thank you, everybody.